And welcome to Dementia Friendly Prince George's County, Maryland, Northern Sector Webinar Series for Caregivers. Today's topic is the positive path towards dementia aware end of life care. Presented by Laura Wayman, sponsored by Prince George's County Government and the Department of Family Services. Welcome everyone. I am so excited to share this essential, important message. And so I want to jump right in. We're going to talk about at First, dementia aware basics and what remains when brain function loss occurs and why we need to change our care approach and dementia aware communication and engagement because we all as a society, we're not real clear. We're pretty confused about what dementia actually is. So what is happening is often we're trying to relate to someone who has dementia symptoms as if they had a healthy brain, because that's the way we've communicated all our lives. And it works with a healthy brain. So I want to show you a real different perception about what's actually happening in their brain. And then we're going to talk about how that particular change in perception and a, a real change in care approach and communication translates over into end of life care and why it's important for that. So how does caring for a loved one with any cause of dementia symptoms affect that family caregiver? So I wanna start by telling you that of course it is extremely challenging and I don't know how many of you are family caregivers, professional caregivers, but I know if you are caring for a loved one or a patient or a resident or a client who has any dementia symptoms, I know you understand me when I say this is probably the hardest thing you'll ever do. And so part of that is us not understanding exactly what's happening inside that person's brain. And we're looking for things we've been taught to look for that aren't real when it comes to dementia. So I want to tell a little story of a family caregiver and how this this particular care, caring couple, how dementia interfered with their retirement dream. So Jack and Peggy, um, they met at a square dance. Peggy was only 17 years old. She met Jack, he was happened to be calling. Um, he was the, the, the caller that had a guest caller that had been asked to come call this square dance. And Peggy had never met him. And yet, she, even though she was very shy, she just instantly fell in love with him. She told her girlfriends, oh my gosh, that man and, he, and this young man, his name was Jack. Um, Jack, that young man is so handsome, I'm going to marry that man. And she walked up and she was just um, in, in the midst of, of flirting and talking with him throughout the evening. And of course, Jack asked Peggy out on their first date. They dated the very next year, throughout the year, fell madly in love. And when Peggy turned, the minute Peggy turned 18, Jack and Peggy eloped. Now they had this wonderful, magical life together. Early in their marriage, they had um, five babies right away, healthy babies. And Peggy found she was a true caregiver at heart. She loved caring for babies and children. She just, it, she dedicated her entire adult life to this. As a matter of fact, she loved it so much. She also invited foster children into her home. Before it was all said and done, she not only successfully cared for her own five healthy babies and and raised them successfully, she also helped to care for over 20 foster children. And all of those foster children had special care needs. She would always find a way as a caregiver with this huge heart, ways to care for these babies, children as they grew up into young adults. Now, all of those children be, became young adults, began to leave the home. Jack and Peggy began to plan for their retirement dream lifestyle they had talked about and dreamed about. So as soon as that last adult child was raised and off on their own, Jack and Peggy sold their house, bought an RV and began to travel all around. That's the way they wanted to spend their entire adult life. And so they were they were beginning to really enjoy this retirement dream, but unfortunately by now they were older. And so it wasn't long 
after taking the time to raise all of those wonderful children, it wasn't long before Jack's health began to fail on the road. And this was extremely challenging for Peggy. First, he began to have macular degeneration. So of course, all the driving fell on Peggy. But was her, what was her most concern is he also began to show signs and symptoms of dementia, which was extremely concerning to Peggy. She had seen many of her friends trying to care for loved ones parents, spouses, aunts, uncles, neighbors who had some cause of dementia symptoms, she knew this was very difficult. So as Jack continued to fail, Peggy gathered him up, took him to their family physician, and they both received the devastating diagnosis that Jack indeed had Alzheimer's as the cause of his dementia symptoms. Peggy knew there was no cure. Peggy knew that no matter how much she cared for him, how well she did that, her job as his caregiver, he was still going to get worse. There was no cure, no prevention. So Peggy decided in order to give him a really competent and sensitive dementia care, they needed to change their lifestyle because she couldn't give him that on the road. So they sold their beloved house on wheels that they had to give up that dream. They bought a little house in a small little town next to some friends of theirs. And Peggy stepped back into that role of being a caregiver, this time for her beloved Jack, who had a progressive cause of dementia symptoms. And at first, Peggy was doing okay. But as he continued to decline, Peggy looked around and realized they had made a mistake, isolating themselves away from any family who now was all long distance, who could come and give her some help. She didn't realize that she was going to need help. She thought she could do this on her own. And her, all of her friends and neighbors, they were older. They really couldn't help her. There was not medical help. There was no magic pill. Even getting Jack to the doctor was challenging. He was just resistant to her um, attempting to care for him. So she decided, well, I'll get some emotional support on the phone from her many family members. And so she began to call them and just discuss some of these challenges. And quite honestly, the family was quite surprised because they had always seen her just caring for everybody, taking, taking good care. But unfortunately, um, she couldn't do this on her own. And of course, the family, the, the young adults now had um, maybe the family of their own or entrenched in their own careers. And they had no idea what it was like to try and care for an elderly loved one who had de progressive dementia symptoms. So they were surprised when she began to share her challenges. However, when they heard her talk about this, they realized how extreme this can be because she began to explain that now Jack was wandering. And so she couldn't take her eyes off of him for a minute or he was out the, out the door and down the road. She even had to call the police a couple of times to come fetch him and bring him home. He was not sleeping at night. He was up and down and he needed constant eyes on supervision. And so Peggy was literally sleeping with one eye open and she was exhausted. And he was unable to process the outside world in a normal way because he had these challenges going on in his brain. So sometimes she would enter the room and he wouldn't was no longer able to recognize who she was or their relationship. And he would become quite anxious believing she was a stranger in their own home. As she's sharing this with a the family, then he says, oh my goodness, you need to get some help in there. And she said, there isn't any help in this little town. I didn't look for help when we moved here. I didn't realize I was going to have help or that I was going to need help and I wasn't going to be able to access it. So I'm really on my own. So of course the family said, well, we'll move back and help you. And she always would refuse. No, no, I'm not ready to interfere with your life yet. I just needed to share, to vent, to kind of talk about this. I'm a caregiver at heart. I promised you when you all moved on in, with your lives that Jack and I would take care of each other. I'll let you know. I'll alert you if I need more help. Now, these, these conversations were becoming more and more, and the family was concerned, but Peggy refused help. Then one night, Jack and Peggy were home alone. Peggy had made Jack a wonderful dinner, as she always did. But as she sat down to have dinner with Jack, Peggy suffered a massive heart attack. Now, Jack's dementia symptoms were so far advanced. He did not recognize that she needed emergency help. 
in his confusion, he eventually wandered outside and said something very disturbing to a passing neighbor that Peggy was tired. She was sleeping on the floor. So by the time help arrived, unfortunately, it was too late. Peggy was gone. Jack and Peggy were my mom and dad. I had to learn the hard way that 68% of the time, especially a same age spouse, if they do not ask for help sick over half the time, 68% of the time, that caregiver will get sick and, and often pass away before that person that they are caring for. I believe that I could have saved my mom's life had I helped her to become dementia aware, helped her to understand that this is a mountain you cannot climb on your own. And there's no prevention or cure or therapy and you have to ask for help. So what I wanna start with is to give you a clearer, deeper understanding about what actually dementia is because we have some myths I wanna bust. Often if I'm doing a presentation, I will stop right now and ask, what is the first thing that comes into your mind if I ask you what dementia is? And almost always people will say memory loss. It's not only about memory loss. It's not really even about memory loss. It's about the inability to understand and process past memories in a normal way. And we're going to talk about that. There's over 100 different causes of loss of brain function, which is the cause of dementia symptoms. So there's over a hundred different causes. It's not always caused by Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is the leading cause, but what these illnesses, diseases, events are doing is they're causing loss of brain function. And it's in all over the brain. As you can see from this slide, with a, a healthy brain on one side, you can see all of that brain function, that brain matter, that information we learn over a lifetime is stored in our brain. And then you see that slide that is um, a, a slide that is ravaged by advanced Alzheimer's. You see that there's actual holes. And what is happening is that disease process is causing you to lose that brain function, that information that we lose over a lifetime that we're gonna talk about. And the other myth is that aging does not cause dementia symptoms. Aging is a risk factor. Aging is not a cause. Uh, I, like I said, there's diseases, illnesses, stroke, uh, vascular events, brain trauma that can cause brain function loss. And our brain shows that in dementia symptoms, but it's not caused by aging. Although as we age, we're no more at risk of getting one of these causes. So that's the tie into aging. As a matter of fact, statistics say that when you reach the wonderful age of 65 or older, you have a 50% chance of having one of these causes of having dementia symptoms. So dementia is not a disease, an illness. It is not even a condition. Dementia is a list of symptoms. So let's talk about symptoms for a minute. In order to have a symptom, it is your body saying something's wrong. Like the symptom of pain is saying that something's wrong. Perhaps you have pain in your shoulder. Perhaps you have the cause of that pain, that symptom is perhaps an injury. And so pain is saying, hey, pay attention. There's something wrong in, this, in the joint of my shoulder. We need to look at that. And the pain is telling you to pay attention to that, that um, loss of function. So dementia symptoms, they are symptoms of loss of brain function, which has to have a cause. We don't just lose brain function. And so you'd have to have an illness, a disease, a, a brain trauma that is going in there causing this loss. And so the symptoms are our way of our body saying, hey, something's wrong. I'm, I'm missing some information here, but you, you must have a cause and there's over a hundred different causes. So let's talk about these different causes that happen. So Alzheimer's is the leading cause. So if we get that disease in our brain, if um, that particular disease, what happens is it's running around our brain and grabbing this learned brain function that we're going to talk about. 
And so each of these causes attacks the brain in a different way. So we'll have different dementia symptoms with each of the different causes. For example, with Alzheimer's, what we usually see is challenges with processing memory, language, and reasoning. And most of these are, most. we'll see most of these symptoms after the age of 65, although there is young onset Alzheimer's, which is a very small percentage of that particular disease. There's vascular dementia, where you might have a stroke. Now, a stroke is going to show different dementia symptoms in a different way because it's more localized damage. With Alzheimer's and some of these other diseases, it attacks the brain in so many different places. We have a long list of dementia symptoms. Symptoms. With stroke, it tends to be a little more localized. So we'll, it, it's a little shorter list. It doesn't do such global damage unless you have another stroke. Now we're so lucky as human beings, we can have mixed causes of dementia symptoms. So we might have Alzheimer's and then have a stroke, which what that means, more brain function loss, a longer list of dementia symptoms in different places of the brain. So different kinds of symptoms. You could have Lewy body disease, and those symptoms tend to be a slightly different than Alzheimer's because Lewy bodies tend to attack a different portion of the brain, although I do want you to understand that over time, they all start to look a lot alike because it's this cross damage throughout the entire brain. But early, we see kind of more um, departmentalized loss. So symptoms with Lewy body tend to be hallucinations, disordered sleep. There's frontal temporal dementia, which we're hearing a lot about because a famous celebrity is having frontal temporal, temporal dementia symptoms, Bruce Willis. And there can be personality changes and extreme language problems, extreme aphasia, inability to talk, which is exactly the um, what um, Bruce Willis is presenting. So, and that usually um, strikes men between the ages of 45 and 60. There's others, um, Kruzfeld Jacobs disease. There can be depression that can cause extreme brain function loss, multiple sclerosis. And then I want to talk just briefly about Parkinson's disease because often people kind of set that aside and that the dementia symptoms are not called symptoms from Parkinson's disease because they tend to be very physical. They tend to be um, um, perhaps tremors or freezing or falling or um, some, some very physical, but those are dementia symptoms. It's just Parkinson's disease is attacking the ambulation portion of the brain, the movement. And so wherever that, that disease or illness or or um, injury is attacking the brain, that's directly attached to what kinds of dementia symptoms, what kind of brain function loss we are seeing. So that's why you can't have dementia, but you can present dementia symptoms because dementia is not a diagnosis. So anytime we have dementia symptoms, what that means is there's something causing loss of brain function. So let's talk about what do I mean by loss of brain function? So infants come to this world, healthy human infants come to this world with basic brain function. Now, basic brain function comes, come, they, they come with that basic brain function of keeping them conscious and keeping their heart beating and keeping them swallowing, keeping them blinking, um, keeping their blood pressure going, all of that that keeps them um, human and it keeps them conscious as well. So that basic brain function, they also come with three really important basic brain functions that they have to learn to process to use more effectively. And that's hearing, vision, and movement. Now they come with that basic, but they have to learn how to process and learn what it means to them. For example, an infant, a human infant uh, comes with vision. They can see, but they have to learn what it is they're seeing, what it means to them, and how to store that and access it and use it later. So uh, a mother is holding that infant, they're looking at mo their mother's face. And it's interesting because infants have been proven, scientifically proven, that they can tell the difference between seeing mommy's face and seeing daddy's face. 
they learn that within a few hours of birth. So they're seeing, but they have to learn what does that mean? So mommy's holding them, they're looking at mommy's face. And it's really important that we understand that humans learn along with how it, that learning makes them feel. The stronger the feeling, the better we learn. So how does that make that infant feel when mommy's holding them and they're looking at mommy's face, that vision of mommy's face, they feel loved and safe and secure. And they attach those feelings to that vision of mommy's face and they store that together. So when they go and access that later, along with it, along with that vision of mommy's face, comes the feelings with it that's always attached as we learn throughout our lifetime. We, we learn to see and what it is we're seeing and how that makes us feel and we store that together. Same thing with hearing. Now, the, this gets really complicated because think about all of the sounds that we have to learn through our lifetime from the time we're an infant because infants can hear when they come to this world. You know, they might hear a a loud sound and it'll startle them and they will they will take that feeling of startling and they'll attach it to that loud sound that alarm whatever it was that's how that sound makes them feel and it's attached when they go access that later but think about all the sounds we learn throughout our lifetime every single word that i am saying your brain now as an adult has to process that particular sound, every word that I'm saying, because my words don't actually come to you as words, they come to you as, as um, the sound wave across, across the universe and what you're hearing now, it hits your ear, your brain has to process that, make it into a word that makes sense to you and how that makes you feel and you store that all together. So every single thing that I'm saying, I'm, my intention is for you to learn um, to feel confident, to feel empowered, to better understand this subject. And you're going to store that together and you're going to go access it later. Oh, yeah, um, Laura told me about this. And, and you know, I'm, I'm using that particular tool and it's working and that makes me feel um, much more confident. That's my intention. And I can prove that to you because if we were in the room together right now and I was doing this presentation, just imagine I'm standing in front of you. I'm telling you this. How would you feel if you made the effort to come just like you did today to come to this webinar and i gave the entire presentation like this blah 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 oh my goodness that would be so frustrating how would that make you feel and first of all you can't process that that means nothing to you and so i think you would start to feel oh my goodness this lady's crazy I, I, i'm gonna get out of here Imagine if we were in a room together and when you tried to leave because you're just annoyed that I'm blah, blah, blah. What if I stood in front of the door and I just put my arms out and I said, blah, 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 and I wouldn't let you leave? Would that make you feel? Oh my gosh, that would be terrifying, you know, and not even giving you any kind of explanation. So that, how would that make you feel? That would not feel good. That would not make you feel comfortable or confident or empowered at all. So it's important that we understand it's about how we feel when we're accessing information and storing it and then using it later. It's also the same with movement. Like I said, an infant comes with basic movement, but they have to learn balance and coordination, specific brain functions. They have to learn that, they have to practice it, they have to learn how to get up on their hands and knees and how to crawl and, and how to stand and how to walk. And they store that with this feeling of accomplishment and independence and pride. Now, when you as an adult go access, getting up out of a chair safely and walking across the room to a destination without having to think about it, your brain is still having to process that historic information that you stored in your brain long ago, but you've learned to utilize that on autopilot and you feel confident. Imagine you get one of these causes of loss of brain fun function, such as Parkinson's disease, and it robs you of that learned balance and coordination, and you have to have help every time you want to get up out of a chair or move across the room. How is that going to make you feel? So I just want you to understand that when this 
this um, learned brain function is lost. When that person has a cause of dementia symptoms, one by one, it's picked out of their brain. It interrupts this higher thinking and automatic processing that you've learned throughout your lifetime. And then you can no longer write or spell or draw or speak or take a test or drive a car. It's, it's so much more than just basic memory loss. Even when you access your memories, you can't access and process them in the same way. And how is that all going to make you feel? Because the feelings and emotions remain. Those babies come to us with these raw emotions and feelings. They learn throughout their lifetime to regulate them, to verbalize them, to share them. But that very part of verbalizing and sharing and regulating can be lost when you've got um, one of these causes of loss of brain function. So when you become dementia aware, who do we give sensitive and competent dementia aware care and support? You recognize dementia as symptoms. And then you start to practice proven strategies, just like we're doing right now, to grow this deeper understanding of what's actually happening in that person's brain. Then we need to break old habits and learn new effective communication techniques. And that is completely changing these old habits because the way that we communicate with someone, an adult with a healthy brain, is no longer valid because we're asking that person to think. And it's basically the challenge that they now have a broken thinker. When we communicate with somebody with a healthy brain, they have to process what we're saying. They have to process our intention and they have to reply with communication in a way that shows that they understand and, and that they find meaning in what you are saying. Though all of that gets broken down when you have dementia symptoms because you can no longer process language or actions or the world around you in the same way. So then becoming dementia aware, we utilize these new fundamental tools to better understand the world through the eyes of those with dementia symptoms who are actually almost getting in their brain and, and learning to have a broken thinker. So how does this dementia aware perception help you to better connect, communicate, and engage? It is exactly what I'm talking about. We learn to think for them. And it's very uncomfortable at first because if you were to, to try and think for someone who has a healthy brain, it almost feels condescending to them. But if you don't think for somebody who has dementia symptoms and they're challenged, it makes them anxious. These ang this anxiety, this confusion, you escalate that. So it's all about how we make them feel. That's what I, I want you to experience because the feelings are what remain. So my Angela, I used to use this quote a lot because I really believe it's true, especially for those with a healthy brain. People will forget what you said and people will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. Why again? Because humans learn best when, when their knowledge is attached to strong emotions, okay? Now, the dementia aware version of that is those with dementia symptoms cannot process what you say. And those with dementia symptoms cannot process what you do. However, whatever you say and whatever you do always makes them feel. So be careful what you say and do. This is where it comes in where I'm going to say we have to learn to talk to their feelings. So how do we do that? Dementia aware strategies for success is that we think for them. A dementia aware individual uses fewer questions and gives fewer options and instead takes positive action and makes simple statements. We think for them. So let's just stop right here for a minute because when you have a healthy brain, what do you do? How do you respond when someone asks you a question? First of all, you have to start your thinker going because you have to think of what is it that they are asking you and then you have to think of what does that mean and then you have to think of a response 
So asking questions to a healthy brain is good because it stimulates their brain to think of an answer. However, it's exactly the opposite when someone has this kind of challenge because when you ask that person a question, it makes them anxious. Now we've been taught to ask questions because it does work with a healthy brain. So when I'm training an entire dementia care floor, this is what I observe. I will go and I'll sit and I'll listen to the caregivers and wonderful, loving caregivers. They're doing exactly what they've been trained to do. And this is what I hear. I hear them go into Mrs. Smith's room. Good morning, Mrs. Smith. Would you like to get up? What would you like to wear? Are you hungry? Would you like to have some breakfast? Would you like me to help you to the toilet? Would you like me to brush your hair? Now, what is that dementia aware? What is that? I mean, I'm sorry, what is that resident hearing? Blah, 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 blah. Because that the, those words are coming to them. Their brain no longer can process those words, especially if it's rapid fire. And so it, it actually locks their brain up and they get more and more anxious and they get resistant. No, no, I'm not hungry. Would you like to go listen to music? No, no. So the more we think for them, the more it actually relaxes that broken thinker. So when I say think, I mean, perceive, understand, reason. For those, we, we do that for those with dementia symptoms, the kinder and more supportive you are in their eyes. They actually, the brain actually relaxes a little bit. So what I mean by that is not, would you like to go listen to the music? It's positive action statements. Positive action statements are things like this. Come with me. The music is wonderful. I love it when we go together. Not, are you hungry? Not, would you like chicken or fish? But, oh my goodness, I bet you're hungry. Oh, the chef made your favorite, fried chicken. Because you see, if I ask that person, would you like chicken or fish? They can only process in the moment what's right in front of them. And I've seen this happen more and more and more. So if I were to ask you, for example, and you have this challenge, would you like chicken or fish? You're probably going to choose fish because in that moment, that's the only thing that's available. But I can guarantee you, and I've seen this happen, and the caregivers are so frustrated. So they bring that person fish, and what do you think they say? I didn't order that. Because by the time they walk away, there's no longer any storage room in that broken thinker. So the minute that information is not in front of them, they can only process in the moment, then that information is gone. So they're every bit as frustrated as you are because there's no knowledge in that brain, no place where they could store the difference between chicken and fish. They just chose fish because that was the only thing that was right in front of them. But that did not necessarily mean that that was how they were feeling. They can no longer voice that anymore. So this change in your care and communication approach guarantees you more relief, as well as helping those you're providing care and service to experience more moments of meaning and calmness and peace. So the more we support them with what they can do by thinking for them and not ask them to do things they can no longer do, including think of an answer to a question, the more support, the more they're going to trust you. So accept that you can't stop, fix, or change the symptoms or behaviors. Most of these causes are progressive. There's no cure. They, they will continue to lose more and more function. And allow the person the dignity of experiencing whatever emotions they are feeling at the time. We give them permission. We join them in their feelings. It looks like you're upset today. I get upset sometimes too. Let's go for a walk. It's beautiful outside. Not, why are you upset? No, they can't answer that anymore. We remain fluid and flexible. Adjusting to that person's feelings and behaviors is needed. Dementia awareness is all about learning to manage, not stop, fix, or change the symptoms or behaviors, but manage these symptoms 
and their feelings and emotions on their unique dementia journey. Everyone has a different list of symptoms and a different way that they're presenting and different feelings attached to all of this loss. So we have to customize our communication to them. So basic dementia aware strategies to keep in mind, no questions or options. Join their feelings. It's okay, whatever they're feeling. I wanna go home. Not long drawn out um, explanations about where their home is or why they're there or whatever. It's more, what do, what does the feelings of, of home represent to them? I know, I love home too. You know, when I'm with you, I feel safe. That's going to, to help them feel better than Oh no, you live here because you have dementia. No, 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 that doesn't make them feel good at all. Use positive action statements instead of questions or options. We stay calm, confident, patient, and present with them in the moment. No, you cannot stop, fix, or change the symptoms, behaviors, or decline, but you can help them manage it. You can join them, be on this journey with them wherever they are. Go to them, don't expect them to come to you. And our goal is to help them feel moments of feeling loved, safe, secure, and valued by using these positive action statements, by not confusing them more with too much information. We keep it simple and we just love them. So your dementia where reality mantra is I cannot stop, fix, or change dementia symptoms and behaviors. Instead, I can only manage them. And by practicing these tools, strategies, and utilizing a dementia aware care approach, you can enjoy more positive and loving care outcomes. It's all about how we make them feel, even in hospice and palliative care. So we join the feelings no matter where they are on their journey, which helps us as the caregiver or any relationship we have with someone who has dementia symptoms, access hospice and palliative care. So I wanna tell you another story. I wanna tell you the story of Veda. Now Veda, I met Veda when I was doing my, my reminiscence class when I was getting my gerontology degree. And Veda was, oh, she was just such an angry, grumpy, um, older woman, she was on hospice. She happened to be at this community. Um, it was a skilled nursing um, memory care community. I don't like to call it memory care because it's more so much more than memory care, but it was a, a skilled nursing dementia care community. Um, and I was doing my reminiscence class and, and we would, at the end of our class, we would gather everybody in a circle and we would have a topic that we would reminisce about um, because we wanted to tap into those um, feelings from their history, their past, that they perhaps wanted to resolve and talk about and share because the, the memories may, may be kind of uh, distant and difficult to reach, but the feelings are always still there. So we happened to be, some of the weeks we were talking about World War II, or we were talking about pets in their past, or we were talking about um, weddings. This particular um, particular topic of, the, of this week that, that we as students were bringing about um, discussion was birthdays. Now, Veda had not really um, been a part of our discussions in the past. She was kind of grumpy and was, I just want to, I can't hear you. I want to go back to my room. And so she, she would, of course, be excused to go back to her room if she didn't want to participate. Now, we started talking about birthdays and suddenly Veda was very interested. And even though she had not been a part of our discussion in the past, she began to tell us, she said, I have a story. I want to tell my, my story of my birthday when I was eight years old. Well, of course, we were all just in, entrenched, absolutely um, fascinated. What did Veda have to share with us? So she began to tell us that she grew up as an only child on a farm that was very isolated. And her mom homeschooled her. Um, and she had to work very hard. She had many chores. She worked very hard. Um, as a child, and her mom, I, I think her mom, fortunately, and, she, and her mom loved her very much, 
she knew that that Veda would like to interact with other children. She wasn't going to school at that time. She was being homeschooled, and so she didn't have any playmates. And so her mom promised her on her eighth birthday she could have a birthday party. And for six months, they planned, and, and her dad took invitations out across the whole um, territory to to invite any children that might be nearby and took it to the schoolhouse. Um, to, they just really made a big deal. They baked, they scrimped, they saved, they made decorations. Well, the morning of Veda's eighth birthday, she woke up and it was a big blizzard. And by now, when she's telling the story, tears are streaming down her, her beautiful older face. No one could come to her birthday. And she was just weeping. She said, I'm so alone. I'm so, so alone. I have no one. And she was just weeping. And so we all gathered around her and we held her hand. And we circled her and we said, Veda, we're here for you. We knew Veda was on hospice. We knew she was very sick and was suffering with extreme dementia symptoms. But we were so blessed that she opened up and shared these so such strong feelings with us. So we all got together as a class and we bought her a big teddy bear and we signed that teddy bear's paws. We said, we love you, Veda, we're here with you. And we brought that to her that very next week and she just beamed and held that. We loved hearing your birthday story, Veda, we're here with you. But she was quite ill. So the very next week after we gave her her teddy bear, when we came back, the staff met us at the door and said, Veda left us last week but she left holding her bear. She was not alone. And I just want you to know that as we talk about going into hospice and um, palliative care, it's important that we understand, especially those with dementia symptoms, they become stuck in these negative past memories they can no longer resolve. And it becomes a part of this ongoing present time reality. Veda was stuck in this, in this um, past memory and she was so angry and hurt and such a prickly personality. Now, persons with dementia symptoms become trapped in these painful memories, but allowing them to share these emotions, it was so powerful when Veda could vent that past, present and future and find some resolution before she passed on. So once again, Basic dementia aware strategies, keep in mind, we're not going to ask questions or options. We're going to join their feelings wherever they are and help them to resolve by using positive action statements, allowing them to feel safe and secure and valued and loved. And we do this by staying calm and confident and patient and present and knowing that we're not going to stop, fix or change the symptoms, behaviors or decline, but we can help them resolve being stuck in these past memories and the feelings that are attached that they can no longer resolve without help. And, you know, it, it, people with, uh, can live for years with dementia symptoms. You know, um, statistics say um, that, that, that you can need care anywhere from two to 20 years once you've been diagnosed with one of these causes. And so caregivers often experience special challenges as someone with dementia becomes a part of their life because the disease progression is so unpredictable. So we want to be there for someone with dementia and their end of life. These dementia symptoms progress. The caregivers may find it hard to provide that emotional or spiritual support. And so sensory connections, because often they're no longer able to process our words, that includes hearing, touch, or sight. That's positive action. Being touched or just massaging their cheek can be soothing. And listening to music or white noise or sounds from nature, that can be relaxing. Just being present, we don't always have to say or do anything. Just holding a hand can be very calming to that person at end of life. 
And it's not uncommon for those who took care of a person with advanced dementia to feel a sense of relief when that death happens. It's important to realize that such feelings are normal and hospice care experts can help provide support to those family caregivers or professional caregivers and help with that grief. So if you're caring for someone with dementia symptoms, you are slowly losing pieces of that loved one or that patient or that resident as the disease progresses. And it's normal and natural to experience grief over time as these losses occur. But in spite of the grief, you're not broken and you do not need to be fixed. It is very human experience but it's also very important to reach out for help because um, you know, support groups and, and hospice experts and um, maybe your own congregation, if you have faith, there is hope in, in that you can find meaningful moments, purposeful interactions and still manage to keep your family or your organization, in, organization intact. Although recognizing that all these relationships will be forever changed, as you become more dementia aware, you learn to take time for yourself and seek help all along the journey through every phase of the grieving process. It's important to let yourself feel the pain and conflicting emotions. Find someone who will listen to you without criticizing you. You must allow yourself to travel down your own unique grieving path, just as you're allowing that person to travel down their own unique dementia path.